Great. Wish I could be there. Well, I'll be with you next week. Yes, sir. <laughs> All set? Great. Well, allow me to welcome uh, members of the President's Cabinet and uh, members of the National Space Council to the seventh meeting of the National Space Council. And it's a particular pleasure to be back here uh, at the Washington headquarters of NASA uh, and to be joined by the NASA Administrator, who is at uh, in Houston, as we speak, doing important preparations. Uh, Jim Bridenstine is with us. But to all who are gathered here today, uh, welcome to the Launch America edition of the uh, National Space Council. Uh, we are one week and one day away from when America will return American astronauts on American rockets from American soil to space. And it's an extraordinarily exciting time in the life of this program, uh, and I know I speak on behalf of the President of the United States when I, when I express my appreciation, uh, uh, Jim, to you, to the entire uh, NASA team, uh, my profound uh, and humble admiration for the astronauts that we'll be speaking to in just a few moments, uh, who will be uh, uh, carrying American leadership back into space from American soil next week, and, and I know I speak for the President when I say how grateful we are. Uh, for the long hours of work represented uh, by the members of uh, this administration of so many critical agencies and that has really uh, put into practice President Trump's vision for renewed American leadership in space. Uh, I had the great privilege, uh, as I see General Hyten uh, with us, uh, Vice Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I had the great privilege of being at the Air Force Academy not long ago when we, uh, we commissioned the very first class of officers to the United States Space Force. Uh, and that combined with the return of uh, American uh, leadership in human space exploration, this is an extraordinarily exciting time. And it comes at an important time in the life of our nation. Uh, we find ourselves uh, over the last uh, many months dealing with an unprecedented uh, pandemic. But we've seen the American people respond from our healthcare workers to first responders uh, to leadership at every level across the country. Um, we have stepped forward and met this moment uh, as a nation. But now, as of today, when all 50 states are in some measure beginning to reopen, when we see encouraging signs of beginning uh, to put the heartbreaking uh, losses uh, uh, that we've experienced uh, and, uh, and the case numbers declining, uh, that. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a time of great hope and a great encouragement. Even the news yesterday of a promising new vaccine being developed is uh, giving hope to the American people that we'll get through this. And when the history of this time is written, uh, we'll record that we got through this together, working together as Americans under the leadership of this president and full partnership with all of our governors. With a whole of government, a whole of America approach, we've responded. But it seems to me altogether fitting that uh, uh, as, uh, as, the, as the American people come every day closer to that day that we put the coronavirus epidemic in the past, that we're approaching such an exciting time uh, in the life of uh, our nation, whether it be the launch of the Space Force or whether it be the launch of American astronauts by, back to space next week. Uh, this is exactly the kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of leadership that has ever inspired our nation throughout my lifetime. and I. And I know it's going to be a great inspiration uh, to the American people uh, when, we, uh, when we see those uh, rockets fire next week. I want to thank uh, a, special, uh, a special group, uh, all new members of the National Space Council who are with us. Secretary of Energy, Dan Briette, the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, the Acting Director of uh, National Intelligence, Rick Grinnell, uh, and the new uh, Director of uh, the President's uh, Domestic Policy Council, uh, Brooke Rollins. We welcome you uh, to the National Space Council and, uh, uh, and are grateful to have your leadership. Uh, today we're going to hear from uh, other Cabinet members that have played such a key role in the development and implementation of the President's vision uh, for American leadership in space. Secretary Chow and Secretary Ross are going to update us on the latest on regulatory reform measures that have really catalyzed 
uh, private and entrepreneurial development of space. The Secretary of the Energy uh, of Energy, uh, uh, Dan Briette, is going to talk about how we're leveraging American energy in space. Uh, Jim Bridenstine is going to give us a report on the, the progress of, uh, of not only Launch America, but also the Artemis program, which uh, will put the, uh, the uh, next man and the first woman uh, on the moon uh, by uh, 2024. And we'll hear from the Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense uh, about the stand-up uh, of the Space Force. Um, uh, I'm also especially in enthusiastic about, um, about hearing from uh, two extraordinarily courageous Americans. Uh, Colonel Robert Bankin uh, uh, is uh, going to be the Joint Operations Commander uh, for the mission uh, that we'll take to the skies and take to the heavens uh, next week. Uh, we'll be speaking to him in just a few moments. Uh, Doug Hurley will be the spacecraft uh, commander as well, and these two astronauts represent the best of America, and uh, and they will be um, renewing uh, renewing American leadership in space from American soil, and uh, uh, we're going to be very grateful to speak to them in the time uh, that they have remaining today. Uh, with that, um, let me just uh, thank all of you. It's remarkable to think in three and a half short years, America is leading in space once again. Uh, with the launch of the Space Force, we're seeing to the security of our nation. Uh, with the return next week uh, of American astronauts to space on American rockets from American soil, we're renewing our commitment uh, to uh, lead uh, in the vast expanse of space every bit as much as America leads in the free world. So thank you all very much for your great leadership. And Jim Bridenstine, uh, share some opening comments, and then I think we've got some astronauts to talk to. Yes, sir. In fact, they would be here right now. Um, they are going through some final medical treatment. And as a matter of fact, part of that testing is uh, COVID-19 testing. So that kind of gives you uh, the situation that we've been operating under during these days. And while it's been difficult, it's also important, which is why we've been moving forward with alacrity. I can tell you another important update that I just got it gives me a heavy heart to share it with you. Um, but Annie Glenn, the widow of John, passed away. Um, just a, maybe even this morning, I just got the update. Um, the reason I bring that up is because it's a reminder of the, the shoulders that we stand on. We think about the, the Mercury program, the Gemini program, the Apollo program, and, and the history um, that, that is behind us. As you mentioned, sir, we're going to launch American astronauts on a brand new rocket. This has happened in American history four times. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and, and now commercial crew. I should say space shuttle, and now the fifth time commercial crew. So this is a historic moment, um, and I look forward to Bob and Doug joining us as soon as they get done with their medical testing. Uh, in the meantime, sir, you're absolutely right. Um, we're going back to the moon. We're going sustainably. We're following the president's base policy directive one. Um, as you announced just over a year ago, we're going to go to the, the next man, but the first woman to the South Pole of the Moon uh, by 2024. And we have been moving forward very rapidly to achieve that end state. Um, and I'll just go through the different elements of that, that, that where we've been making great progress. We all know that SLS is a rocket program that has been met with challenges and delays and cost overruns. But I want to be clear. We are very happy right now at NASA that the SLS core stage is complete. I want to say that again, sir. The SLS core stage is complete. And all four RF-25 engines have been integrated. It is now assembled at the Tennis Space Center in Mississippi, and it will be going through a green run test this summer and into the fall. I will tell you, um, we, we would be complete with the green run by the end of the summer if it wasn't for the coronavirus, which set us back. We had an outbreak down at the uh, Stennis Space Center. But I'll tell you, we, we're in great shape there. The SLS rocket is looking very positive, and we're going to be ready to launch the Orion crew capsule around the moon in 2021. It's hard to it's hard to imagine. That's about a year away. We're looking at uh, by the end of 2021 having a crew capsule around the moon for the first time since the Apollo program. 
Um, so I want to be clear, the Orion Sea Capsule is also complete. Also, the European Service Module, which is, of course, the propulsion and the life support capabilities for the Orion Sea Capsule is complete. They've been integrated. We sent them up to Plumbrook, um, which is part of the Glenn Research Center up in Ohio. It, that thing came back amazing. Uh, they, I was kind of shocked at how little problems we had with the Orion Crew Capsule, and I'm knocking on wood able to do that. Um, the Orion Crew Capsule is back at Kennedy, and it is waiting for the SLF rocket to be in it where it will be mated, um, and then launched in 2021, towards the end of 2021, around here. Um, in the meantime, we continue to develop the gateway, which is how we make sure that our landing systems on the moon are sustainable. We need reusable landing systems. So we need to be able to go back and forth between the gateway, which is a small space station in orbit around the moon, and the surface of the moon over and over again. If we make those landers reusable, we will have a sustainable program where we will be able to have astronauts on the surface of the moon for long periods of time, and we will be able to access any part of the moon at any time um, for strategic objectives of, of this nation. So these are important capabilities. The, the power and propulsion equipment for the gateway is under contract and being developed. Um, a small habitation module, we call it HALO, is also being developed. Those two elements are going to be mated by 2023 and launched into orbit around the moon, um, establishing our outposts uh, around the moon by, by 2023. We also have international partners that are very excited about the gateway and you know the, the Japanese space agency, the European space agency, the Canadian space agency are all excited about building elements onto that gateway uh, for long-term um, human capability in orbit around the moon. Um, I would also say in order to achieve this uh, monumental moment of, of sending a sea capsule around the moon, by next year, we have to have Launch Pad 39B ready to go. Launch Pad 39B has its history in Apollo and the space shuttle program, and and sure, it is it is ready to go. Um, and so we're we're very excited about this new program. I, I think it's also important to note that we have um, an extravehicular mobility unit, sometimes called a spacesuit, that we have now designed here at the Jimmy Space Center. We've designed it so that we can walk on the surface of the moon, which is very different than doing spacewalk at the International Space Station. We've got dust issues, we've got thermal issues, um, and, and we have a, a space suit that is, um, I wouldn't say it's ready to go, but design elements are, are, are almost there, and by 2024, we will be ready to walk on the surface of the moon. Uh, we also, as you're aware, sir, announced, um, we had a graduation ceremony for 11 new astronauts. Um, these are the best that America has to offer. I know that you looked over their bio. Of course, you were there when the class started. They called themselves the Turtles because of a story you told when they first came in into the astronaut school as, as a kid. Um, but I will tell you that they have not graduated. They're the best of the best. Um, and we, we actually put out a new initiative for, for a new astronaut class. We had 12,000 astronauts um, applicants. So this is a, a demonstration of how inspiring NASA is to the nation. Uh, and, and certainly, I think it's important to note, that we put the requirements on the astronaut candidates um, higher than they've ever put before. Um, and yet we still got 12,000 applicants. So the moon program is underway. It's going fast. We're, we're also going to pursue, we've got the commercial lunar payload services program. Next year, we're going to launch the first commercial lander to the surface of the moon. I'm talking about, for scientific capabilities. Uh, NASA has the payload ready to go. We've got a number of contractors that can land on the moon commercially with a small lander, and we're going to do that for the first time in 2021. The, the Artemis program, we named it Artemis because Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo in Greek mythology, um, is strong, sir. We are so grateful to the leadership of you, the chairman of the National Space Council, making sure that we have the resources necessary to achieve these milestones. Um, but, you know, when we talk about the program, you know, that is, that is, that is the um, 
really the starting point for our journey to Mars, the long-term goal. But immediately, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we are launching American astronauts on American rockets to the International Space Station for the first time since the experiment of the shuttle back in 2011. Um, we have now for nine years been without a human space program. And in fact, the Space Policy Directive 1, we have been without a moon program. In the meantime, China and others around the world are going to the moon uh, very quickly. But we're coming back. We're coming back fast. We've got everything we need uh, to lead the world once again. And our international partners are coming back and wanting to join us in these efforts. Um, but in order to get to the moon, we first have to be able to launch American astronauts on American rockets. Of course, the commercial crew program is, is the, 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 the standard for how we the lower orbit features, and we uh, have two amazing Americans with us right now. Um, I just got told that they are now um, out of their medical testing, and they are with us. I'd like to introduce Chuck Hurley and Bob Lincoln. I want to I want to just say that you know this. Um, these are veterans of the space program. And they've flown numerous each of them flown numerous times in space the space shuttle to the international. Station. Um, and of course, if you look at their bio, we're talking about an engineer from a uh, test pilot in the Marine Corps, and we're looking at a, a test engineer from the Air Force, uh, PhD from Caltech in mechanical engineering. Um, these are uh, the best that America has to offer, and they are about to embark on a test flight. The very first time we're going to launch American astronauts on a commercial vehicle this time. A, a Falcon 9 rocket with a, a Dragon crew capsule, and they're going to they're going to they're going to carry the American flag to the International Space Station. So I'll let Bob and Beth say, say a few comments. And Mr. Vice President, I'll let you ask them a few questions. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thanks for that uh, uh, very thorough and informative uh, review uh, of. Uh, of uh, renewed American leadership in space here at NASA. I know President Trump is grateful for all of your efforts, all of the efforts of the NASA team that's looking on, and we're incredibly proud uh, of the timetable that you're on. And, uh, and what a privilege it is um, to uh, convene the National Space Council and have an opportunity at the dawn of a new era of uh, American leadership in space uh, to be joined uh, by uh, two NASA astronauts, two very experienced uh, NASA astronauts who will be returning to space next week uh, on American rockets from American soil. And uh, let me formally welcome uh, Colonel Robert Bankin uh, and, uh, and Colonel Douglas Hurley. And uh, on behalf of the President of the United States and on behalf of the American people, thank you for your um, long service to this nation. Uh, thank you for your incredible uh, leadership uh, in NASA, and thank you for stepping forward uh, one more time. Um, and uh, welcome, welcome to this meeting of uh, the National Space Council. Now, by way of uh, of uh, introductions, I can I'm proud to say that uh, uh, Colonel Bankin is going to be the Joint Operations Commander for the mission, uh, responsible for uh, all the uh, rendezvousing, docking, and undocking. A uh, native of Missouri, been a NASA astronaut since 2000, but uh, before that he was a flight test engineer general in the United States uh, Air Force. Uh, Colonel Hurley uh, is going to be the uh, spacecraft commander uh, for DEMO-2, responsible for activities launch, landing, recovery. Native of uh, Appalachian, New York, uh, selected as a NASA astronaut in the same year as his counterpart, um, 12 years into his NASA career. Colonel Hurley retired from the United States Marine Corps, uh, where he proudly served as a fighter pilot uh, and a test pilot for more than 24 years. And uh, Colonel Hurley, I will tell you that uh, my Marine Corps fighter pilot son uh, uh, will be very jealous that I had a chance to speak to you today. Um, he really will. Uh, each of these men have completed two space flights aboard the space shuttle and have logged more than 1,300 hours in space, 6,000 hours of training. They've been through rigorous preparation for next week's uh, launch, and uh, uh, let me uh, let me just recognize uh, let me just recognize you, uh, Colonel Bankin, uh, and afterwards uh, we'll get some comments from Colonel Hurley. But um, uh, thank you for being with us today. I know it is a very very busy time 
but uh, we're, we're really honored to have a chance to speak to you for a few minutes. Colonel? Yes, you're first. Uh, well, thank you for that. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning as we move towards uh, this historic flight. We are just a small a giant team that's going to execute this mission uh, to launch America again. We're pretty excited to launch M39 Alpha. Uh, Luke and I have launched from that facility before, so it's a really exciting to bring it home again. Uh, Doug and I have both spent a year in the astronaut office uh, going through the process of launching uh, American astronauts values, and we are really excited to experience to uh, bring it back home and share with the new classes of astronauts what it's like to launch American from American soil. We do want to thank the team that uh, worked so hard continue to press forward with this initiative uh, in the face of the challenges in the COVID-19 situation. And we're both uh, really excited and uh, prepared to pull this off and uh, bring it back home. With that, I'll pass it over to our mission commander, our space traffic officer. Thank you, Robert. Great words. Very inspiring. Go ahead, Carl. It's great to talk to you, Mr. Vice President. Greater Bridenstine, great to see you again, sir. Um, we can't uh, emphasize the amount of hands that touch this vehicle from start to finish. The folks in the commercial crew program at NASA and the folks out at SpaceX, it's just been an incredible journey to get up this far. And in, and in some ways, it's really hard to see if we're going to launch next week, but it's uh, incredibly exciting. You know, as Bob mentioned, the challenges of the last few years for the entire world and the United States and how the humans have come together during the uh, pandemic. So to get us to the point where we're at four tomorrow has just been uh, a lot inspiring. And I hope that it's great uh, respect for all the work folks have done to this point. It's a real honor to just be a part of this program and to uh, launch American from Florida uh, one more time. Well, thank you, Doug. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, it, it really is a testament uh, to all of you. And uh, as you said, all the hands in this program uh, that uh, even in the midst of a national crisis, NASA stayed on mission and kept doing the work. And I, I have to tell you that uh, it's going to be a great inspiration to the country next week uh, to see you two go aloft. Uh, from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Doug, you were, I, I'm told if I got my my facts right here, you were on the final uh, s uh, space shuttle mission. And uh, this is gonna be a little bit uh, different. Uh, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love for you to share with the National Space Council and to those looking on, uh, what, is it, what does it mean to you to be going back to space from American soil uh, after nearly 10 years uh, and uh, uh, since we uh, since we ended the space shuttle program, uh, number two, did you expect us uh, to be headed back to space? And uh, number three, uh, how how different uh, how different is this experience uh, in uh, in training and uh, and in the uh, and in the rocket itself, the spacecraft uh, from uh, from the shuttle mission? Whatever you want to reflect. Yeah, I appreciate that. The I guess the first part of it is it was a tremendous honor to be part of the shuttle flight. Um, just 30 years of history and being able to close it out uh, the right way um, was just a uh, humbling experience for sure and uh, great to share with uh, the crewmates and then, of course, all the folks that were involved with the shuttle for so many years. So it was just a tremendous honor. Um, you know, the last uh, Plus years have been a lot of work and a lot of work to get us to this point where we're ready to walk again from Florida. And uh, I certainly won't uh, deny that there have been a amount of challenges in those times. Uh, you know, just getting to the point where we had two companies to provide that service and then looking for all those technical challenges that uh, came along the way. 
I think Bob will uh, certainly agree with me that the shovel training program would very much establish uh, almost down to the minute we knew what we were going to do a year and a half before we do every day. Mm -hmm. and it was very well understood. The training program that we have again was something that we took an active role along with the training folks here at NASA and training folks at SpaceX to develop. So it's been a work in progress for at least the last few years, and it will probably continue to be honed for the next few flights until it gets to be this big product. It was a very neat experience to offer our insight and uh, operational experience to make this training program where it is now, but I think it's, it's going to continue to improve. But it was almost a completely sick experience from the uh, shuttle training program. Is that right? Is that right? How about the spacecraft? How do you think? Uh, uh, and uh, one, I'll go to Bob, uh, Colonel. How how, uh, how different uh, is this ride going to be? Uh, you think from your shuttle ride? Is or is it different at all? Oh yeah, I, I think for both of us, and I are a very different experience from the Falcon Nine and the Dragon at the space station. Uh, of course, years have passed, so we have a much more modern design with the Dragon vehicle, and we're looking forward to that. Those who have seen pictures of the inside of the space shuttle uh, saw a lot of and duct tape uh, additions that were not there when it was originally designed, and, and many of those pictures that were added have been integrated directly into the vehicle, and we're very appreciative of that. I think the, the other thing that we're really excited about is this partnership that SpaceX and NASA have uh, able to achieve to drop on NASA's experience as they continue to innovate and, and build something new and move forward. So I think we're really proud of uh, that partnership and, and proud of the vehicle that we, uh, the team, uh, all that uh, specific need to uh, Mr. Obama and uh, the rest of the SpaceX team, uh, we're, we're all one group to pull this mission off and uh, we're really looking forward to you know doing them proud and doing a good job to take care of the rest of the members of our team as we accomplish the mission of docking to the international space station well it's it really is interesting to me uh, doug that you talk about uh with the shuttle program you literally day by day had af after years and years you had a training plan in place and uh, with this one it sounds like it's uh, uh, with the commercial crew concept, it's been you've been uh, helping to invent uh, the preparations as you've gone, and uh, that's that's a great testament uh, uh, to uh, both of you uh, and uh, uh, to the the fact that uh, uh, while Americans astronauts have gone to space many times over the last uh, 50 years, you all are in a very real sense trailblazers of a new era. Do you? Do you feel that, or is this? Uh, do you see this just more as a continuation? But how, how excited uh, uh, how excited are you, Doug? Just simply about about whether it uh, whether it be this mission, uh, whether it be Artemis, uh, whether it be uh, whether it be the uh, United States Space Force. Uh, what, what does all this mean to a guy that's uh, uh, that's that's been at this uh, uh, for a great career like you? Well, thank you. I, you know, Tremendously exciting to see where we are on the cusp of launching a commercial vehicle next week. Artemis, uh, far behind. I mean, it's an exciting time to be uh, in the space business. And, uh, you know, the we're going, you know, beyond the Earth orbit after so many years. Uh, it's just, we, we are honored to be just on the ground floor, so to speak, uh, as we work our way back out. I mean, it's uh, almost wish I was a young man again because it's going to be an exciting time. I know the feeling. <laughs> oh, that's a great line. And, uh, I'm still a young ass. <laughs> uh, uh, listen, uh, we'll let you go. I, I do. I, I want to commend you. You all are not uh, just t two great astronauts. You uh, you are part of two great astronaut families. Uh, I understand both of your spouses are also 
uh, astronauts. And uh, so this is a, uh, I, I know this is a very, very special time. And uh, um, I just want to tell you, I know I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be in Florida tomorrow. I, I, I am sure that I will be sensing the excitement building in Florida. Uh, there, you will have had a lot more people watching uh, nearby at previous launches. I think they're they're encouraging Americans to watch from afar. But uh, I want to assure you that uh, uh, the president and I are looking forward, uh, looking very much forward to cheering cheering you on. Uh, I know you'll be carried aloft uh, with the prayers of millions of Americans uh, for a, a safe and successful. A mission, and let me just say, on behalf of all the members of the president's cabinet uh, and the president of the United States, um, uh, thank you for your courageous uh, service, um, and uh, thank you for the time today. And what I know is, uh, I know this is a head down, uh, every hour of preparation uh, week for you. But uh, it's a real privilege to be able to speak uh, to both of you, and uh, and as as we think of. Uh, the passing of uh, of Annie Glenn, uh, uh, another another incredible member of the NASA family. We just say, uh, Godspeed uh, to both of you. Uh, so thank you all very much, and uh, let's give these two a round of applause. Thank you, Matt. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you all. Okay, is the press all out? Can I just say, how cool was that? <laughs> yeah, that was cool. That was really cool. Uh, is that anybody else? Okay. Wow. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, GM, great, great, uh, great selection there. What uh, outstanding, outstanding two astronauts, and uh, uh, they're going to they're going to lead well, and they're going to represent us well. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, great job. Great job. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's get down to some uh, business. The National Space Council, Jim. I think you're going to stay with us, aren't you? Good. We'll see, I am. We'll see, see if you can find a chair there. It looks like they're going to make you stand up for the next uh, 40 minutes. I'm not going to. I'm on my stool right now. Oh, okay, good. Good. <laughs> I feel better about that. Um, again, let me just thank. Uh, let me thank uh, uh, Jim and and all of the NASA team uh, that are looking on uh, from afar. Uh, we are all very excited about all the progress and uh, very excited about next week. And I'm looking forward. Uh, to being with you to share that moment uh, in Florida. And uh, it's going to be raining a lot, uh, raining a lot on the East Coast this week. But uh, any idea about the uh, uh, potential for launch? Do they have a long range uh, projection? Yes, sir. We're, we're actually really good right now. We have a readiness review on Thursday and Friday where we go through every element of the launch system, the crew capital, the space station system, subsystem. A, a day and a half with all the engineers. Um, and pending that, I mean, right now, anything that is slowing us down, the weather looks good. Um, we've got great interagency partners with the, the, the Space Force, uh, of course, as launch, uh, the, the clearance of the rain, um, you know, a lot of the providing for the airspace. The FAA has been with, with airspace as well. So I think we're in good shape. Um, great. What, one thing I did on uh, our astronauts showed up, so I wanted to give them some time before they jumped into the simulator. Um, we now have, for, since 1970, uh, under contract, a human landing to go back to the right. time system. And, and we modeled that after what we learned from the commercial resupply and commercial crew program. Right. Of course, Bob and Ted are going to be launching on the commercial crew program here in just a few more days. But we, so when we want to go with partners, which of course was a space policy director. So we are not owning and operating the landing system. We're going to land on the moon. We're, we're going to help develop the landing system side by side with private companies. Right. But then we're going to do something with them, and, and we will become a customer, one customer of many customers. Um, and we will 
against each other on cost, on innovation, and of course on on safety. So, so all of these things um, conspire to say what we learned on commercial crude to support the international. Yeah, crew that's really is informing point. how we're going to go to the moon. That's and really great. Uh, really a good story. Really a great point. Uh, yeah, I saw the I saw the contract. Uh, announcement uh, for the landers, um, and um, that's very exciting. And I'm not surprised that it was informed by your commercial crew experience, Jim. So good. Uh, we're uh, the sound people in the back. We're dropping out about every fifth word, but I still got. I think we all got uh, almost everything that you said, um, and appreciate your leadership, Jim. Why don't we go to? Uh, I'm going to go to Secretary Chow for uh, an update uh, on. Uh, uh, DOT's efforts, and then we'll go to the Secretary of Commerce. Um, a regulatory reform has been a big, big piece uh, of unleashing exactly the kind of uh, uh, private uh, uh, space entrepreneurial activity that we continue to see on an increasing basis. So thanks for your leadership, Madam Secretary, and uh, we look forward to uh, an, an update on both of your efforts. Great. Mr. Pre uh, Vice President, your passion for the mission at hand is truly inspiring. It's a great pleasure to join you and members of the National Space Council. As mentioned, you've all heard, the first American-built spacecraft to carry an American crew into space since 2011 will be launched. This will demonstrate the growing capabilities of America's commercial space launch industry. To ensure the continued viability of our growing commercial space industry, the Department of Transportation, under your leadership, has been making organizational and procedural changes that will enable innovation and protect the public. First, the FAA, which is part of the DOT, has established an Office of Spaceports to support existing sites to better manage the licensing of new spaceports. With the licensing approval last week of Titusville in Florida, there are now 12 spaceports in the United States, and the FAA is currently working on applications for nine additional sites. So we're on our way. Second, to ensure better accountability and have the responsibility for all launch and reentry licensing and oversight responsibilities under one executive, we have completed the reorganization of the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. One advantage that we already see is an improvement in communications with the stakeholders. They now have a single point of contact for questions and feedback. Third, in addition to these organizational changes, the office is re-engineering all of its internal processes. So this will promote effectiveness, efficiency, and scalability, and will better meet the future needs of stakeholders while continuing to protect the public. Now, these last two efforts will maximize the benefits of the proposed streamlined launch and re-entry rule, and that's what you're talking about. In response to the President's mandate and your mandate as well, the Department issued a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking to streamline and increase flexibility in its launch and re-entry licensing requirements. The Department is currently evaluating the comments to its NPRM and expects to meet the Council's directive to publish the final rule in early fall if everybody around the table is going to cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> the proposed rule will provide a performance value regulatory approach uh, that will keep pace with innovation while protecting safety. It will strengthen collaboration among stakeholders by encouraging both legacy and new launch and entry re-entry operators to suggest and implement design and operation solutions. It will allow for a single license to be granted for multiple launches from different locations. So in summary, I'm pleased to report that the department is on track to meet the mandates set forth by the president, by you, and by this council. Thank you. That's great. Great progress. And how many uh, spaceports, you said? We've got about oh, 12 additional ones that we are uh, currently doing. So we've got about uh, a dozen. Yeah, that's exciting. Very exciting. Great work, and uh, you heard her admonition about uh, working together, right? All right, good. That's how we move as quickly as we do. Uh, Secretary Ross. Thank you, Vice President Pence, for the opportunity to update the National Space Council on the Department of Commerce's implementation 
of Space Policy Directives 2 and 3. After extensive discussions with industry and government agencies, we published this morning on the Federal Register website a new remote sensing rule. It ensures that U.S. space companies will remain competitive in the fast developing global markets for commercial remote sensing products and services. Second, our Office of Space Commerce will very soon launch the Open Architecture Data Repository that will consolidate existing and new space situational awareness data sets. And that will be a major breakthrough in assuring that we can deal with the problem of space debris and space collisions. Excellent. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, and I, I appreciate you referencing Space Policy Directive 2. And uh, Mr. Secretary, you and, and Secretary Chow have done such a remarkable job. Our the President's vision there was that the federal government would, would be a partner and a customer um, and not a competitor of America's uh, entrepreneurial space industry. And uh, you all have done remarkable work on that. And uh, have, I want to thank you for that. We've, we've cut in half the licensing time for new sensing activities from the statutory 120 days to 60 days. Uh, it's outstanding. Outstanding. And, uh, and we're seeing a tremendous amount of investment. Oh, yes. Uh, in, in space companies around the country as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah, just phenomenal. Well, listen, um, thank you very much. Thanks for that uh, great report. Um, and uh, we're going to continue uh, to work very closely with, uh, with both of you um, and, um, um, uh, and, and take further action. I think the President signed an executive order, in fact, uh, uh, roughly a month ago, uh, that recognize the rights of private companies to recover and, and use space resources. Right. Uh, and um, and that's, that's all part and parcel about us wanting to unleash the full power of American ingenuity and innovation in yes. space exploration. So thank you all for being such willing partners in implementing the President's vision. Um, and thank speaking, you for your leadership. Well, it's a privilege. Um, uh, speaking of resources, uh, Secretary of Energy is with us. Dan Briette is one of our newer members of the Space Council. I want to welcome you again. Um, uh, give us an update on, uh, on your department's uh, space technologies, policies, and efforts to collaborate with NASA and DOD sure. uh, on these issues impacting um, American energy. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. And uh, I do have a great report for you. But before we begin that, I'd like to thank you for your leadership of our nation's response to COVID-19. And uh, in thank particular, you. the leadership that you and the President have shown in stabilizing the world's energy markets and uh, protecting America's uh, energy producers. So thank you for that, sir. Sincerely appreciate that. Oh, oil was back up yesterday. Oil was back up yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are back. American energy is back, as the president yeah, says. The president and I both never thought we'd be cheering increasing oil prices. <laughs> <laughs> There's a point. Where There's a point. Back. Well, it's good. It's, it's a so fine thanks line. For, it's a fine thanks line. for your leadership. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, and Administrator Brinstein, thank you for your leadership and your partnership with our Higher Performance uh, Computing Consortium. It's through this consortium uh, that we're not only going to uh, find the solution to this current pandemic, but we're going to shorten the time in which we find the solution by using America's supercomputing capacities. So thank you for your partnership there. I look forward to working with you. And Godspeed uh, to you and your team on your flight next week. I look forward to uh, cheering you on with the rest of the council. Uh, as the Vice President mentioned earlier, uh, we are uh, rejoining the Council. We did this back in February, and we're excited to work with you to tackle the challenges of a new era of space exploration and development. Uh, the Department of Energy, DOE as we finally refer to it, uh, has an accomplished history in, in all of these efforts of reaching to and even beyond uh, the horizon. And as I shared with you at the last Council meeting, I argue that in many ways uh, DOE uh, not only stands for the Department of Energy, it stands for the Department of Exploration. And we look forward to being good partners with you. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, to, better, uh, to better communicate and uh, focus our efforts within our departments and focus our efforts on the President's space policy, hmm. I've established a high-level space coordination group uh, that cuts across our entire enterprise and reports directly to my policy team. And I've also charged 
uh, the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, CEV, as we call it inside the department, with developing strategic advice and guidance for our space-related programs. I'm excited uh, to have Admiral Richard Meese, uh, who's a former STRATCOM commander, and uh, Mr. Norm Morgenstein, who's the former CEO of Lockheed Martin, to co-chair this effort for us within our department. Uh, in addition, we've been meeting regularly with our colleagues at NASA to better align our space program activities and support America's return to the moon, uh, our next giant leap to Mars, and our bright future, which lays before us. And uh, together, we and NASA are revitalizing a memorandum of cooperation uh, and standing up senior level working groups that will jointly address some of the highest priority technical hurdles that NASA has identified for us. At the same time, and meanwhile, I should say, we've also launched a series of briefings for Department of Defense officials uh, on our capabilities that could contribute to the mission of the new U.S. Space Force. Uh, we've had a long relationship with our friends at the Defense Department, as well as excellent collaboration uh, between DOE's National Nuclear Security Administration, NNSA, uh, DOD, NOAA, uh, and NASA for the release of space weather data that's collected by DOE-developed space-based nuclear explosion monitoring payloads. That's a mouthful, but it's important work that we've done at DOE. Uh, we'll rely uh, on the experiences, on those experiences uh, that we have to grow our engagement with the Space Force uh, by identifying DOE technical capabilities that we think will support and enhance this important critical mission. And recognizing the important uh, and large potential of a future space economy, uh, we've redoubled our efforts uh, with the U.S. Department of Commerce and some of our sister agencies uh, on encouraging U.S. space commercial growth in a safe and stable orbital environment. And in particular, DOE's world-leading work in the next generation of computing technologies, like I mentioned earlier, uh, which extends to quantum information, artificial intelligence, we think these could greatly assist in commerce's role to protect space industry partners from space weather-related events and debris that we all know exists out there. Our 17 national laboratories are actively working on a portfolio of space-related research and development activities, and our Office of Technology Transitions has established a dedicated portal on its laboratory partnering service, which is available to the American public, and it, where information can be found on our work within DOE, and it spans everything from launch vehicles to robotics to propulsion. And one of, one of the most fundamental needs uh, for any space mission is a reliable and sustained supply of power, and this is where we at DOE, I think, come to the fore. Uh, specifically, as part of the broader strategy to regain American global leadership in nuclear energy, we're leading efforts with the private sector to promote development and deployment of small modular reactors and micro reactors. These are technologies that could be modified to provide sustainable power sources for space applications such as surface power and thermal, nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, we're already working with our colleagues at NASA and DOD on applications of these technologies and we look forward to the expanded use of safe and new, secure nuclear energy technologies. In particular, we are partnering with NASA to demonstrate nuclear thermal propulsion and surface fission reactors, which will support power requirements for crew transportation to the moon and eventually Mars, as well as help us power our envisioned outposts there. With nuclear propulsion, we can potentially cut the time of space travel to Mars by half while offering increased mission flexibility, or as we like to say within DOE, our goal is to get to Mars and back on one tank of gas, and we will do it. <laughs> but this is only just the beginning, sir. Um, the President's space policy has challenged us to think differently about the space demand that, uh, dom domain uh, than we have uh, during the space race or even during more recent times. And, um, you know, your leadership, sir, has called us together to meet this challenge, and I'm honored to be here and represent a department uh, that will be an essential part of the solution. So thank you again. Uh, for the opportunity to join you today. I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, thank you for bringing all those creative energies together, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, one tank of gas uh, <laughs> to Mars. Um, one tank of gas. But uh, you're you're absolutely right. It's it is uh, reliable, sustainable power is the essential to space exploration and uh, developing new innovations um, uh, is. Um, uh, uh, is e exactly the right place for the Department of Energy. 
Although I, I will tell you with Jim Bridenstine uh, here at the National Space Council, he may fight you over the Department of Exploration because uh, <laughs> we may have to give you both an extra E in your title. Uh, Sir, I, I would, I would uh, Secretary Burlett is an amazing partner and we're very grateful for his board working efforts on these very important cases. That's great. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, Thank that's, you, Mr. That's high praise. Thank you, sir. National Aeronautics and Exploration Space Administration <laughs> and the Department of Energy and Exploration. I think we could perfect. Yeah, we could kind of take that to OMB and see if it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, whole new acronyms. Um, great. Really, really outstanding report, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, and uh, now we there's been so much that has been happening in the area of a defense. We're pleased to have. Uh, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, David Norquist, with us, who also, I, I want to say that he and Secretary Esper have just done a remarkable job on the President's Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, David, we thank you. Um, uh, we know um, the uh, incredible uh, work uh, that uh, DOD has done implementing the President's vision uh, for ensuring that America remains as dominant in mm -hmm. space as we are on Earth and land and sea. I also want to acknowledge General Hyten's seminal role uh, in uh, America's uh, military um, uh, um, security from space throughout your career, uh, and I'm I am uh, among the many many people who believe that um, you being a vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs um, uh, at such a time as this in the life of American um, security leadership in space. Uh, is no accident. And so, uh, General, I want to thank you uh, for your leadership as well. Uh, what, what's happening uh, with the rollout of the Space Force, and I, I think I, I was actually told that we're allowing people to apply to transfer. Can you can you uh, articulate that for us, General, maybe if there's a nearby microphone? I, I, can you, the, number, the number of current uh, airmen who have applied to transfer into the Space Force so people are running to apply. Uh, it just opened up last week, I, I believe, and uh, we've already had thousands running. Uh, the, the interesting... I heard the number 2,000 in right? like the first few days. And, and it was the, uh, my wife's Facebook account just blew up with everybody just <laughs> posting, sitting in front of a computer uh, applying to transfer because those have been our friends and people we've worked with our entire lives. Uh, it's interesting uh, if you apply as a, a general officer, it's, uh, it's a little more complicated. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, we might keep you right where you are, General. <laughs> I, just, I just go back, to, you know, Bob and Doug a while ago when they said, yeah, I, I wish I could just go back and be a young astronaut again. I just wish I would go back and be a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. Those 86 new lieutenants right now, they, they have dreams and and who knows what they're going to do the next 30, 40 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so well said. Well, uh, my, my son is a young captain, and my new son-in-law is a, is a lieutenant in the Navy and a pilot, and uh, they're, in that, they're in that generation, and we're incredibly proud of all of them, all of them. So, uh, but I, I want to acknowledge, I know the, uh, the Deputy Secretary would not, uh, and the Secretary and the President would not want me to miss the opportunity to thank General Hyten for his leadership. Uh, in this area throughout your career, throughout your long and storied career. Uh, but uh, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Norquist, you're uh, recognized for an update on the Space Force and, uh, and relatedly, U.S. Space Command. And, we, and also we had uh, Jim uh, down at Kennedy. We had a very successful launch of the X-37 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, back in space. Uh, uh, I'll say to the Assistant Secretary of State, given countries around the world something to talk about, which is just fine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're incredibly, incredibly proud of, uh, uh, of, uh, of all the work DOD is doing. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice President and colleagues. And I'm glad to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to update the team on some of the key space-related activities being executed at the Department of Defense. We've seen significant changes to the space domain over recent years. Access to space is no longer limited to a few actors. Today, there are over 50 countries and multinational organizations that are operating in space, and the commercial sector is also helping set a new pace for technology and innovation. Moreover, our strategic competitors, 
have made space a warfighting domain. As Secretary Esper discussed last week, we know that our adversaries have weaponized space in the last several years. With the establishment of the Space Force and U.S. Space Command, the United States, in cooperation with allies and partners, will maintain a persistent presence in space in order to deter aggression, provide for safe transfer, transit in, to, and through space, and uphold internationally accepted standards of responsible behavior as a good steward of space. Fortunately, President Trump has recognized this and taken decisive action. Our national security strategy affirms unfettered access to and freedom to operate in space is a vital national interest. To support this, President Trump directed DOD to make organizational and structural changes to include establishing the U.S. Space Force and U.S. Space Command. We are making important progress. On December 20th, 2019, we established the Space Force as the first new branch of the Armed Forces since 1947, and we are rapidly developing and integrating space power doctrine, capabilities, and personnel across the Joint Force. Vice President Pence, you swore in General Raymond as the first Chief of Space Operations last January. 16,000 personnel have been assigned to the Space Force, and initial staff has included representation from the Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. The Space Force is growing. As the Vice Chairman mentioned, we commissioned 86 officers from the Air Force Academy into the Space Force on April 18th, and the Space Force is developing its doctrine and is preparing the first ever capstone publication on space power doctrine. Separate but complementary to the Space Force, the U.S. Space Command was established on August 29, 2019, just nine days after our last National Space Council meeting. General Raymond and the U.S. Space Command have made substantial progress since its establishment. Space Command is updating its plans and policies to reflect the new demands of the warfighting domain and last week finalized its campaign plan, outlining how we will compete and posture the force to win against any adversary. This year, we submitted our first ever separate budget request for the Space Force as part of the 21st FY21 President's Budget Cycle, identifying approximately $15.4 billion of transfer funds from across DOD to resource the Space Force. We announced the creation of the Space Advisory Committee of the Defense Innovation Board this subcommittee will be a panel of business leaders, scholars, entrepreneurs, and technologists to provide independent external perspective on current and future challenges and opportunities in space. Even as we implement these vital organizational changes, the number one priority of the Department of Defense's Space Force remains mission execution, providing soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines with the world-class data and services from space to ensure they can operate confidently anywhere on the globe, maneuver effectively, and strike with precision. The result is a holistic approach to leadership in space across the U.S. government, so our military forces are able to ensure unfettered access and freedom to operate in space. As we char charge forward with these efforts, we must simultaneously increase public and international awareness of the changing character of the space domain. There are many risks from miscalculation or misperception in space, and it is critical to establish standards and norms of behavior in the space domain. So think of the international maritime rules that were established over centuries, rules that enabled clear identification of irresponsible behavior and rules for engagement and for self-defense. We must develop the equivalent for space and ensure that nations abide by these rules much as we do with the maritime domain. To do so, we are working hard with the Department of State, as well as our international allies and partners, to ensure the space domain is secure, stable, and accessible. So thank you very much for the opportunity to highlight these critical space activities. The Department of Defense looks forward to continuing to collaborate with the executive agencies represented here today and to accomplish great things for the American people in this fast developing domain. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary. We are uh, really grateful for your efforts, the efforts of Secretary Esper. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it is exciting to be uh, around 
during this historic time. And I, I can't uh, I, I can't thank you enough for all the energy you've you've put into this personally. Mm -hmm. I want to commend you for that and give the secretary our regards. I will. Um, I'm going to call on a, a few members here about that have been working on a number of these issues. I want to get a few thoughts into the record. But before we leave the defense space, um, uh, let me at least take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, the passing of Colonel Thomas uh, Falzerano. Uh, who was uh, a commanding officer of the 21st Space Wing, Peterson uh, Air Force Base. Um, a uh, remarkable leader uh, who uh, left us too soon, uh, who fell last week. And um, I just, uh, I want to mention him for the record, the National Space Council. He, uh, uh, he played uh, a vital role uh, in, uh, in standing up uh, the United States Space Force, and he'll ever be remembered uh, as a part of the uh, first generation of Space Force leaders. And we uh, we uh, uh, send our deepest sympathies uh, to Colonel uh, Falzerano's uh, young family, uh, and I know we express the great uh, gratitude uh, and respect and sympathies of the President of the United States as well. Uh, with that, uh, let me recognize um, uh, some people that have also just been great allies in uh, implementing the President's uh, vision for space leadership. Uh, he is a tight-fisted director of the Office of Management and Budget. As the, uh, the uh, NASA administrator can personally attest, uh, but has been a great, great steward of, uh, of uh, America's taxpayer resources uh, in the last budget. Um, uh, Russ Vogt worked closely with this team uh, to um, and with NASA to uh, provide increased funding for human space exploration. Um, and uh, I'd just like to recognize you for uh, a, a few thoughts about how uh, uh, of the role that OMB continues to play in ensuring that we're focusing uh, those resources on President Trump's vision for human space exploration. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I think one of the things that as a result of your leadership and the, the President's leadership is that we've never had uh, as close a relationship with, with NASA um, and with Jim. Uh, we have early on made it our mission to stay linked up and see things through each other's eyes so that when a net resources is necessary, uh, we at OMB are not dispassionate but have a rooting interest in both uh, securing those resources and then as, as this week is our first chance to really see it. Uh, in motion. And so that's why we are very excited for next week. We wish you the best of, of luck and, and all the blessings of God as you uh, take this critical step that is crucial to get us onto the moon by 2024. So uh, whether it's securing the resources or ensuring that your regulations go through in a timely manner, which we will absolutely ensure that we do, or considering future departments to be created for the cabinet of the United States. Uh, all of these ideas are things that we will continue to, to work on, but it starts from the premise that has been laid out by you and the president, which is we are all in and we work as a team and we're going to get the job done. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Russ, and I thank the whole team at OMB. Um, I've never heard the term rooting interest, um, but it's very descriptive. Um, uh, and I, I, I know the President is grateful for the way that you, you've worked closely uh, with the NASA team to find out where we can efficiently provide resources to implement the President's vision. And uh, uh, we're grateful to your whole team uh, for your role in that. Uh, I'm going to recognize a few uh, new members, but I'm, I'm going to have uh, Secretary Wolf and M Ambassador O'Brien um, bat clean up on this with their thoughts. But uh, Rick Grinnell is the acting director of national intelligence, um, has stepped into that job uh, after serving the United States with a great distinction um, at a critical outpost in Europe as our ambassador to Germany. And uh, But Rick, I, I know you are a space enthusiast. Uh, did you have any reflections on uh, what you've heard today and particularly what, uh, uh, from your outpost, what you see as the significance of America's continued investment in space security? Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I'm really honored to be here. I'm struck with uh, one thing as we, we listen to everyone. It's super inspiring. It's very exciting. But I'm also struck with the well, this is nice to do. It's really something that we need to do. Mm -hmm. You look at the intelligence uh, from our enemies, 
and others across the, the world. I, I'm looking every day at Iran and Russia and China and what they're trying to do in space. This is not just something that we need to do first, but we need to do it because it will ensure safety of not only Americans, but ensure the safety of freedom-loving people around the world. But we see everyday threats that are continuing in space, threats to our water and to our technology and to every item that touches a chip. This is something that we need to do. It's not just nice to do. And as inspiring as it is, I want to just state for the record that this group and all of the work that's gone before me is uh, visionary. To step out and to do this, where it seemed, I think, in the beginning, something that uh, the public thought was just a, a nice to do, it's really encouraging to have experts that recognize that this was something that we had to do and that we were late. So thank you for your leadership because leadership means stepping out when others think uh, it's not quite necessary. And I can tell you as direct, acting director of national intelligence, it's very necessary. And thank you, Rick. Uh, very well said. And we look at those briefings that uh, your teams prepare every day. And uh, those are uh, now, those are very apt words, and I'm, I'm glad to have them in the record today. Um, uh, with that, uh, she is also the new uh, director of uh, the Domestic Policy Council uh, for the President of the United States. But uh, the administrator will be happy to know she's a Texan, uh, and there seems to be some relationship between Texans, which uh, and the space program. So, Brooke, I, I just want to do it. I want to do invite you, and it had something to do with another vice president, if memory serves. Yeah, that's right. I want to invite you to share a few uh, remarks, your reflections, your first space council meeting. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here on just a couple days on the job. Um, having been with the president and the vice president the last two years in the Office of American Innovation in the White House and now taking on the additional role of the Domestic Policy Council is obviously the honor of a lifetime. What I want to say is just very simple and very straightforward. This president 